Welcome to this week's episode of The Nero Show. In today's episode, Jesse is on the lookout for a new bike. Canyon, Trek, Specialized, Giant. What can we sell him? Pro teams that are only offering the one bike to their riders. Are they at a disadvantage? Training pitfalls for big grand fondos? And should Chris run some white shorts? All right, let's get into it. All right, I'm pretty excited, Jesse. I'm pretty excited. We're back. We're back in the same room, all that kind of stuff. But that's not actually why I am most excited because I saw in the show notes... You've written something down. You've written, Jesse is on the look for a new bike. And I tell you, (laughs) I got got a little tingle. I got a tingle on the way here thinking, oh, my God, we're going to be selling him a new bike. This is so exciting. I'm such a flip-flopper, though. I'll put that in because I'll get all hot and bothered and I'll be like, yeah, oh, that looks good. I I wonder what I would get. What would I get? Let me me just flip and I don't think about it. Let me stop you right there because I want to ask you what – what was the catalyst for this for this thing to be written in the show notes? Can you take me to the mindset that you're in? What did you see at that time? It, it's just chat. You just talk about, oh, this bike's like three watts faster and, oh, the wider tires are pretty cool and, oh, yeah, and then you just you talk about it enough and you just convince yourself and suddenly then I'm looking, well, what, what would I get? It, it was just pure just chat. There's too much chat. Yeah, you ruined it. Did any makes or models sort of come across you at the time that were you were sort of thinking about or? Well, well, yes. Well, it's an aer- an aero aerodynamic bike frame that I, I interest that I'd be looking at because I ride it and race at high speeds. I do believe I would benefit from an aero bike to some degree, and that's so. That's where I'm looking. And then you start, you know, we'll compare brands for the show, and just just out of curiosity, and then I'm going, oh, the Propel, the giant Propel. Oh, it comes with a power meter. Oh, okay. So the oh, dear Di two models, nine or ten k. That's not that's not too bad. You know, that's that's okay. Oh, what's a what's a Canyon Aero? Oh, okay, that's similar ish price, a little bit more. Okay, that would. That'd be I'd be interested to ride that, you know, the sixty mil wheels, and um, started going down that path. I'm really interested. You said the giant, all right? Because I had a I had a similar almost experience to this. That uh, I think Dave Arthur put up his sort of long term ish review of it. Had a good look at that, and my first impressions were that of that was a eh, bit underwhelming, bit underwhelming, and just. Uh, the package is the package. Giant's always going to be good value, all that kind of stuff. But I just felt particularly underwhelmed by by that frame. Having said that, I recently went and had a look at one. New, they've um, case. You've got a couple in there. Went and had a look at it. Oh, you screwed. Yeah. And I got to say, yeah, in real life, that bike, <laughs> that bike was was doing it for me. It's the like, power of the shop floor. Yeah, it's real. It's real. Yeah. Yep. Hundred yeah. percent. And because I was coming off this, I was on a heavy. This is this is just this is just chat, right? But I was on a heavy um, Cervelo buzz. All right. So when I was over uh, with Jeff, he's got his his soloist. Yeah. And I was like, oh, geez, that soloist is good. <laughs> it's a bit of a do it all kind of bike, isn't it? And I, I was sort of sniffing around it, well, because it was in his garage, and unfortunately not my size. But I kind of thought, geez, it's, a, it's kind of a little throwback between the the old school sort of road bikes and the, and the modern. So I, I was kind of a bit taken by that. And then that, of course, took me further down the, the Cervelo route and starting to drift into the into the S5 sort of thing. Fascinated by what Visma are doing at the moment with Jonas running 30 mils on his S5s, and that was kind of in my brain as well. It is, yeah. And there's something when you see them as well. I was in the shop recently and I saw the SL8. And had the giants there, the TCRs, and it's just the the bike when it's brand new and it's polished up. It just I don't go into bike shops very often, so this is probably news to no one besides me. But when you see them in person, and you oh that looks it looks really good. And then as well, when you see them in person, you're looking at the there was a giant TCR for about nine k, and they had the new SL8 in there. If you just pulled someone off the street, they wouldn't tell. And said which one's more expensive, they probably wouldn't be able to tell. Like just the look of them in person is uh, impressive, no matter what what the price is. Did you have any impression of, of the the frame, just in general? 
Like, was there an overwhelming feature of any of them that you noticed? Not no, really. Not really. They're just they're thinner. Yeah. They're just everything is thinner. Okay. Isn't it? That's. It's, it's, I'm looking at these going. What? These are just these tubes are thin. thin. Yep. That's that's totally. It's you, and you don't. I think this is why I was underwhelmed by the videos or any videos of these things until you see them in person because they all still look like big chunky ass aero bikes and then you get to them in person and they're like, oh my God, there's nothing, there's nothing on this. And uh, again, like Jeff's foil, very similar. Like I, you look at that in the profile shot and you're like, oh, that's a big chunky fat aero bike. You actually look at it in person and you look down for the brief moment I was on, I was like, there's nothing here. It's so skinny and narrow. Yeah. But the thing is, uh, you get a, I get a bit, I went through a little, you know, bit weak there. I was looking at things and then, but then you get to the reality mm. <sighs> and this is, and then you go, okay, well, I've got the handlebars that suit me and that are the correct width. So I'd probably have to change that out. And I've got three sets of wheels of different depths. And then if I went to disc, I would only have one set. So I wouldn't have my 80 mil deep wheels and I wouldn't have my 30 mil deep wheels. So that's kind of annoying. And then very quickly I turn myself off the idea and, go, and just <laughs> appreciate the bike I It's got. really interesting you say the wheel thing because I totally – that the rim brake thing? I don't know. Maybe – because that was totally my mindset as well, riding those bikes, is you would have a fleet of wheels and it wouldn't be anything. I'd be like, oh, you're going to do a crit tomorrow. Yeah, I'm going to put the 80s on. I'm training. I'm going to put the 30s on. Like that's just what you did. And now, like I actually – so – Reserve have also sent me a set of 30s. I haven't put them on the bike yet because I have, like, there's ne they're never going to line up. Like, I'm always going to have to stuff around with them, scratch around with the calipers. Oh, I see. And then you're also like, well, what am I doing with the 30s? Am I going to use these as, like, training ones? Uh, like, And so you always just fall back to, I'm going to run mid-depth wheels for every single thing I do and – the day of the race wheel is kind of gone. I reckon it's because you drank too much frame Kool-Aid. Because mm. back in the day, you would change your wheels because you'd want to run the better suited wheels for more speed on the course. But now that everyone is so pounded by the frame marketing, you're kind of relying on the mentally on the frame being really good that you're kind of forgetting about the wheels. You're like, I'll just mm. run the 50s all the time. Probably doesn't cross your mind that if you had a set of 80s at a flat race, it would be faster because all you're thinking about is how good, how aero the frame is. So you reckon like you're on the air road with your 50s, and this is it. This is the pinnacle of speed. We're back. We're back just, to calling it the neuro bike. Oh, sorry. Yeah, okay. We're, the neuro we're, bike. We're, we're not, right. That that cat's going back in the oh, bag. All right. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No. I mean, potentially you're right. Um. But like, yeah. I drinking too much frame Kool Aid, and I'm therefore the frame is I'm just relying on the frame to make up the difference. Yeah, maybe. But it's also that thing of... Like why don't... Because back in the day you would have changed the wheels on the bike because mm. it makes a difference. But what I would have done is I would have just... So I would have done all my training on the box standard 30 mil or alloy, alloy section wheels. That would have been just the day-to-day. -day. And then I only would have put the deeper race wheels on on more limited situations. Mm. Whereas now... And this is kind of this is a totally other topic, but I now expect my race wheels to be my everyday wheels, my wet weather wheels. Like they are not only meant to win me races, but also slot me around Centennial Park on a Wednesday. So that that is, yeah, I don't know when that shift happened, and it must be kind of annoying for, I don't know what. I'm Maybe it's the inconvenience of the disc brake. I think caliper. it is. There's got to be something because yeah. it, going up to a Kuna on a Saturday on a set of 30s feels amazing. Would be nice. And then you go and do Heffron and you've got a set of 60s, bang. Yep. It makes sense to change the wheels. <laughs> yeah. No, that's a fair point. Would would be nice. All right, quickly coming back then to your imaginary shopping. Mm -hmm. So there was a couple of things that, that you mentioned were kind of interesting you. What doesn't interest you? Like what's... Is there anything just off the off the market? You don't even need to give me a reason why it isn't. Mm -hmm. Is there anything just not not floating the boat for you? 
<laughs> no. So you would you would buy a, a an SLA? No, I'm not spending twenty grand on a bike. <laughs> In my head, seem to. <laughs> uh, so that's off. The, and why would I spend twenty grand on a bike when I can go just as fast for ten? It's just I would just not do that just because. So oh, that yeah. would discount the SLA's gone, the Cannondales are gone, Scots are gone. Um, oh, well, 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 the Scots not SL8 territory. Uh, the foils like are fifteen. The top of the line, Scots fifteen. I think the top of the line. It's 5K difference. Yeah. 15, okay. you, you know, UK, okay. your old Tegra builds foil. What's that? I bought 12 or something? Like that's probably a bit closer. And I think this foil, nah, foil looks cool. Cli- like any climbing, like how, if I'm getting a new bike, I want to have an, an aero, but why would I get a, a do it all or sort of a, a climbing? I just would get an aero bike. I've got a climbing bike already. So definitely, yeah, a full one. But that's probably why I wouldn't get it at the SL8 either because. Mm. I don't want to do it all mm. bike. I want an I want an aero bike. Mm. So it would be an aero bike, I yeah. get. Or a system a system six would be cool. That also comes up in pro team chat because you talk about teams. I hate bring. I, I don't know why I'm bringing up specialized again. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. <laughs> but the everyone wants to be on a specialized team. I think nowadays, they, but they only have one bike. Mm. You cannot tell me. That okay, the SL eight's out now, but let's leave that aside. Let's use everyone was saying you want to be on a specialized team when they had the SL seven. You can't tell me that an SL seven performs as well as a Cervelo S five doing a lead out at sixty k an hour. It's just not possible. The f- frame isn't as aero, or as well as a System six, or as well as a Scott foil. So that you want to be on a specialized team. Thing doesn't really hold water to me because mm-hmm. I would want to be on a team that has multiple bike options. Mm-hmm. So being on Jumbo Visma, and if I'm if I'm Wout van Aert leading out Olav at Tour of Britain, yeah. I'm picking an S5 with 60 mils because I'm going 70k an hour pr- probably. Right, you need that benefit, and then I can also hop on an R5 with 30 mils and go and do a stage of the Tour de France. Like that is better than an SL7. Um, there's just not that many teams now that offer the du- the, the double bike, yep. or even UAE. They're at a disadvantage. You're on a, a V4 RS, isn't keeping close to a System Six at 60k an hour. So, I would be I I'd be on a team that has two bike options. Yep. And I don't know why. Still, we heard so many people saying, "Oh, they want to be on a specialized team." Like, I just don't get it. I'd pick a team that has two options. It was so hard to do. Imagine the how pay how much of a pain it ass is for Yumbo Visma. You got to pretty much have a whole separate truck driving around yep. with everyone's R fives. Yep, I think the Canyon teams are off. that's that's a clear differential for me. And there's there's going to be a day for an ultimate, and there's going to be a day for for an aeroad. Um, but you're right. Like it it seems to me that in the chase for that middle ground of the market, potentially those teams are kind of losing out a little bit when it comes to the. The, the pure pro performance end. Mm, yeah, and it is. I mean, the the difference between a Super 6 Lab 71 and a System 6 isn't much, but isn't much when you're going 65K an hour is a lot, Yeah, <laughs> especially when the margins are that thin. I'd love to see some of the data on it like, because the setup that still fascinates me is Jonas and his S5 with his 30 mils on climbing days. He's clearly, that's his that's his rig now. He goes for that. Nine times out of ten, in, in, unless it's just pure. What does what does Patrick call it? Um, rampas. Rampas in humanus. In humanus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> unless it's rampas. that. Yeah. But I'd love to see the data on that because that's a that's a kind of I love those kind of Frankenstein setups when they when they do run it. And it's the only kind of and you can only do a Frankenstein setup when you've got the optional the team lets yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, firstly, if the team lets you, and also if the bike sponsor lets you. I, yeah, I'd hope that, that that that's free choice, and that's not the that's not Savello saying, "Hey, we really kind of want you on the S5." Um, but they seem to most of uh, Sepp Kuss seems to barely ride the S5. Yeah. So uh, yeah, yeah. But then that could come back to peak talks chat that the bigger <laughs> rider benefits less from the aero bike. Oh right, I see what you mean. So the smaller rider gets more benefit out of it. So that's why mm. he goes that route. I don't know. Mm. I, again, it'd be really, really cool 
to uh, what's what's his name? Gerard Gerard Varum? No, the guy who designs the Cervelo bikes. Oh right, anyway, there you go. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's just less and less because when the aero bikes were coming out, guys would be swapping stage to stage to stage between bikes, and now even on the the teams with bike sponsors that have an aero bike and a climbing bike, it's not that common to swap. Mm. I think that's more of just because of the logistics of doing it is a massive headache. So kudos to the teams that do it. Okay. And as well, I mean, Colnago's aero bike's super old. Mm. What was that called? The concept or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I don't even know if that's probably not very good. I've got a so uh, – I don't have any inside knowledge. Mm -hmm. I've got a feeling UAE's going to jump. Going to jump? Yeah. What does that mean? They're going to leave Colnago. Got to just got to – I don't know. It's got a little feeling. A little feeling. Watch this space. All right. So cycling YouTube or YouTube in general, general seems to be dominated at the moment by listing things that are good and things that are bad. Now, mm -hmm. I, I find this kind of weird to talk about because I don't tend to watch those videos, but holy God, a lot of people do. It's obviously a very beneficial thing for People, oh, it is getting into the sport. I did kind of giggle at one of them. So um, Francis put up a video that was something like that was like 10, 10 things that a pro, I don't know, mechanic likes or something like that, 10 things that he hates. And then literally the next day, GCN did like the 10 most hated things on the like, just like, guys, stop doing this. These you thumbnails know? are cooked just too. Like, it's like, oh, ah! stop doing this, people. <laughs> Have some dialogue or something. I don't know. Anyway, so it got me thinking. We we uh we're gonna attempt this, Jesse, off the bat. I'm gonna st I'm gonna start with one. So th I don't know whether this is. I'm not giving naming a number of how many of these are. I'm not even sure these are good things or are they bad things, but they're things. So this is Chris and Jesse's list of things. <laughs> okay. Yeah. First thing. And next week we can do ten more things. Ten more things. <laughs> All right. So the first thing, tubeless syringes, or as my Wife laughs at me because I wash it inside in the house, the Chris's penis pump that he keeps out in the garage. Oh, God. <laughs> um, amazing. These things are brilliant. It's changed my life. Um, I have now successfully set up all my tubeless wheels at home using the penis pump quite happily. Remove the core, squeeze her in, happy days, pop it out. What the hell were you doing before? Um, using the bottle and just doing the dribble. Ah. Oh. Mm. Okay. The manual dribble. Right. Yeah. So you weren't pre-bead uh, catching the bead with a dry pump. Oh, dry pump. <laughs> and then and then putting the sealant in. Yes. Okay. So I was. I was dry right. pumping. Right. <laughs> sealing. Then removing core. Oh, that's what you're doing now though. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Removing core. But I, I removed the core and just used the, the, the manual dribble. Mm -hmm. Dribbled it in. And basically went everywhere and then got enough in there, pour back in, pump it back up, sealed, happy days. Why don't you bring this up? I bought a tubeless syringe the other day mm -hmm. because I've been doing what you – I did what you were doing. You just pour it in and mm -hmm. then, you know, thing it on. Because I had one before, but it clogged because obviously really? tubeless sealant is designed to clog holes. So with the syringe, you're pushing sealant designed to clog a hole through a hole. So it would always, I'd get the sealant and then it would just not go into the fucking thing. I was like, what is the point of this? So anyway, so I bought a park tool one and maybe I've got new, I'm trying the new silica sealant with the carbon strands in it. Everything's got to have carbon in it. Mm. And hopefully that doesn't clog when I'm injecting it into the valve. Well, yeah, that's that's where you bring it in inside into the, the uh, washing up area and you give it a good clean out and then it dries where all your other sort of pots and pans are and your wife says, what's the penis pump <laughs> doing there? So that's... That's where that okay. comes from. And it cool. also, it's also, for me, it allows me to get much better idea about how much sealant's going in there. I know people commented on that video that I did about the bike that I was running in the US saying I put 80 mil in tires, saying, how dare you put so much in? That's so much rolling, additional rolling weight. I was like, like these are people putting 20 mil of sealant in. Newsflash, you put 20 mil of sealant in, that's not even going to seal the tire. No, it'll dry up straight away. So yeah. pump it in. Yeah. I will say with the tubeless, some of the setups I've had to do are cooked. Like mm. I can understand why people don't want to do tubeless, especially so two things. If I can't get the bead to seal 
And so I, it's terrible for the environment, but I use the CO2 canisters the to do the system. pot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I've, I can never do them with a hand pump and I don't have a compressor and the blasters thing never, never worked works. for me. So I've been doing CO2s. But sometimes the, C- the CO2s just don't work sometimes. Or it takes a few. So that's annoying. And then sometimes my wheels that I do it on need rim tape. Yes. And sometimes the rim tape doesn't seal, so it'll go down overnight. Yeah. And then so I'm taking it off, redoing the rim tape, trying to get a seal so it doesn't deflate over 24. And sometimes I just go, I can understand why people don't want to – it's still not – it's just – yeah, they got work to do, I still – I think, with the tubeless. The Princeton wheels that I had for a bit were terrible for that. They they were meant to have their built – like a built-in rim tape, but it still leaked. So so it – it was just like that. I would lose so much PSI. A built-in rim tape. It wasn't a no no uh, hold. Uh, it was a no hold. Oh, and it thing. still it still sort through. of leaked. Okay. Yeah. Now I'm trying to find what they call it, but the reserve wheels and like one of their selling points is that they're meant to be they're meant to be able to seal via a foot pump, which I have officially done. So I don't I don't know what they've done. I don't know how they do it but they actually do seal via a foot pump. Literally put the tyre on, make sure the tyre doesn't go over the valve, just go at a, with a foot You've pump done it. and it's it just blew, blew up. Okay, that's it a game changer. It blew my mind. Yeah, that's big. Okay. I'm trying to work out what the text Oh, called. that's so – that is a total headache. I, and, so, and I lose I, I'm sh- I lose my temper pretty quick. So I'm, sometimes I'm there at night and Nicole's like, oh, he's doing his tubeless again. <laughs> oh, God. Because it's – it can be – it's wor- I, I think it's worth it. But – um. Yeah, it can be a pain sometimes. And can we – I also see, just randomly saw a few people – oh, oh, tubeless is overrated because they were getting flats recently, just some people in Sydney. I don't understand that. Do the, Are they not carrying the plugs around? I don't know. Because the plug – I've never not been able to plug. You get a flat, pull out the plug, bang, put it in, spin it around, pump it up, and you're on. I don't, they must not be taking the plugs with them. The Potentially, peel, or, or don't, know how to, don't know how to use them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it's, the, yeah, the only down, the worst part of the tubeless thing for me is, and this happened to me when I came back, was that I went to then ride, so I built the bike up, went to then ride the next day, came back, came out to the garage to get on the bike and the wheel had deflated. And then you're kind of in that awkward yeah. situation of like, do I, so you pump it back up and it's held air, mm-hmm. you're like, oh. I don't really know because there's no it. obvious hole in this. So there's obviously like a, there's a, uh, an issue with the, um, the setting. So I penis pumped, put another 60 mil in. You've got to stop saying Sorry. that. <clears throat> I used my tubeless sealant <laughs> injector yeah. and put the 60 mil in, pumped it back up, happy days. But okay. then you're, kind, well, you're, you're still walking on eggshells. Yeah, yeah, because if you go for a ride and it's deflating and you and it's not to do with the tyre so you can't plug it, you're absolutely screwed because mm. you Unless you have a spare tube, no. So I'm yeah. I'm up to th- I take three canisters, and the Dyna plugs. Now I don't take any tubes. No, neither, neither, no tubes. Um. So this. So that's it. That's our first thing on the list of things. The the second one, you asked me about this the other day. Do you wanna do you wanna bring it up? Oh, oh, the chewing gum chewing ride. Gum. Chewing gum ride. Chewing gum ride. Because I, I had just been into a habit now of chewing gum as soon as I start a ride for every ride. I was like, we were in the park. I was like, do you ever chew gum when you start? And you're like, yeah, I chew gum for every ride. Mm. There you go. So I don't know, you people listening, um, chewing gum rides. It's a freshener, yeah. I yeah. find. A little freshener just sort of, you know, it gets you, especially especially if it's a sort of evening ride or the, the late afternoon sort of one, just gives you a little spark up, nice little spearmint, potentially peppermint, just gets you going. 10, 15 minutes. That's all. Beyond that, it's... It's just a lump of rubbish in your mouth. So 10, 15 minutes, normally just the other side of the Anzac Bridge for me. I love it, yeah, as well because I usually have a coffee before I ride. Now if I don't chew gum, it feels gross. You're drinking coffee, go out for the ride, the mouth's getting a little dry, and then you're usually drinking some form of sugared water, carb mix. Oh, God. Once you start doing the chewing gum, it's really hard to, to go for a ride without it now. I love it. Do you, would you just spit your chewing gum out on the ground? What's the, what's the etiquette uh, yeah, there? Is, it, is chewing is gum biodegradable? I have. But, uh, <laughs> no, I've outed myself with a lot of things on this show. I'm not sure I should be. Because uh, if you chew gum know. for long enough, 
it kind of just goes to nothingness in your mouth. So spitting out gum on the ground <laughs> is as long as someone doesn't step on it and it doesn't get like lodged into the concrete, technically it's biodegradable. You know what? You know. Sit on the fence for this one. Okay. <laughs> okay. Right. What about banana peel? Oh, that's been chucked. Yeah? Yeah, that's been chucked. Oh, but I do think you shamefully I, do like a slide drop or are you just loud and proud to banana peel? To be honest, I, I would not have carried a banana in 10 years. I don't <laughs> really? see the point of that being in my – I don't see the point right. of that 20 grams of carbs taking up that amount of room mm. in my back pocket. I'd much prefer it just to be full of – In fact, I saw that today someone was writing – with a banana peel, like the, the kind of half-eaten one and like the, uh-huh. the droopy skins hanging out the pocket. And I'm just looking at it going, for all the benefit that banana skin's giving you, just this was not worth it. Right? Just take some lollies with it. I'll chuck a banana peel because it is it is biodegradable. You get a bit worried someone sees you just tossing something, they don't know what it is, and suddenly you're copping an earful. I, I don't really chuck anything. But do you remember the first couple of years racing some of the – the national stuff here in Australia, it was just a freaking free for all. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like a proper, I remember that yeah. first race I did, and guys are like, then. Oh, yeah. Anywhere, everywhere. It wasn't that long ago. No. And it wasn't even it wasn't even banned. Like when no, I no, started no, racing in the NRS, you'd have a gel and you'd just drop it oh, yeah. in the middle of the road. Just like motorbikes next to you, commissaires next to you, just chuck it down on the ground, keep going. Yeah. Well, that can't have been even more than three or four years ago, yeah. I reckon. Uh huh. Yeah. Now you'll get you'd almost get booted yep. out of the race if you do that. You can't. Yeah. Yeah. I've been fined for you know, guy. We were you were sticking the um, the gel wrappers like in the saddle. Yeah. I got fined for that yeah. as well. Yeah. Well, that's pointless because they fly yeah. out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just times. That's that's a that's that a, a quick very one. quick change. They managed to do that. That's good. I mean, there's a big difference between a gel wrapper and a piece of chewing gum, uh, but. Yeah, I will. Uh, yeah, I should probably stop spinning my chewing gum out <laughs> on the middle of the road. But when I'm in my zone two, I can't stop and go to a bin. My heart rate will drop. Out of, it'll drop into zone one. Like the gains. Think of the gain loss. Okay, so that brings up potentially number three. Where are you with a hydro pack? Do you ever see a, a point? Hydro pack. Hydro pack. Camelback. Okay. Hydro pack. So <laughs> potentially there. The, uh-huh. the the theory being three four hour ride. Uh-huh. You got two liters back there. So that's you are gonna re, you're gonna at least not stop once. I've done it before hmm. on the road. I'm on board. I've done it in Centennial Park. Before. Oh wow! Yeah. Okay. You you know there's a water stop right <laughs> yeah. there. Okay. Yeah, but you have to pull over. Okay. Yeah. I I I wouldn't do it. That, that's such a Hubbard move. I wouldn't do it now. No. I think. But on a hot day, right? It's thirty degrees, and that could be. I might be going through. One and a half liters of fluid an hour, easy. Maybe even two liters. So that means you're stopping every more, yeah, at least every hour to fill up, and that's so annoying. So I, I, I'd consider it. I, I wouldn't consider. There's no way I'd do it just out of shame. But it, it. I mean, good call. I think you're totally out of touch. I think it's. I think it's cool. I think it's gone from. Oh yeah. Hundred percent. I think it's gone all the way. It's it's flicked the other way, and it's now it's now very very highly regarded the hydro pack. Um, yeah, for those exact reasons, I think I think the the new ones look pretty good relative to to it. To do the chop with one on, get get That'd one in be there. Good. First daylight save. I reckon we, first daylight savings chop when it's in the sunlight. We just we both rock up with our camelbacks. See, I've been <laughs> I've been influenced though. I've been riding around with bloody. Gravel, yeah, gravel it's probably normal people. to you. Yeah, it's just yeah. Like, you're not wearing a hydro pack. What? It was weird. <laughs> um, yeah. So the what was the only the only thing I found is it got warm. Like the actual Ooh. water gets sort of particularly. Yeah, and not, I mean not very comfortable as well. Oh no, if it's I, hot and it's kind of sweating your back up. I think that's an overrated issue. Really? Overrated issue. Yeah, <laughs> not too bad as long as you're moving. You're not climbing sixty minute climbs. Not too bad. Okay. All right. Yep. Let's yeah. Hydro pack. Let's keep an eye on that one. That may be making an appearance on the list soon. Yes. Chewing gum and a hydro pack. What are we up to? Number four. four. Number four of the list of things. Driving to rides. I'm. I am. I'm for it. I'm going to make this the summer of driving to rides. Yep. When I'm when I'm going to ride by myself, I am going to. 
do it a little bit more than I have in the past. Because, okay, here's the thing. I am really sick of coming home from a ride or the first 30 minutes of my ride being so pissed off at all the stopping that I have to do. Yeah. All the, like it actually ruins my ride, genuinely ruins my ride. I get half an hour into the ride and I'm like, why did I bother doing this? I'm doing this stupid rat run. Should have gone into the park. Should have gone into Centennial Park and just gone round and round and round. But I don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. I did get into a little bit of a habit of driving 25, 30 minutes in the US to go do a ride. And it's it wasn't that bad. You could actually make that portion of the ride. Like I would make phone calls or I would listen to an edit of this or something and I'd actually make that sort of semi-useful. I'd got over the thing of, you know, notorious for – driving to a ride and leaving my shoes at the other end or, or that kind of stuff. But I'd gone into a habit of that. It's just a habit thing. And I reckon there's two or three rides that I can do here that will be so much better if I just drive that little bit. And we just don't do that in Sydney. It's like it's proper frowned upon. I have no I I don't really even know why, but yeah, it's I'm gonna I'm gonna have a go at it and I'm gonna put it on our list of things. Oh, okay. You can yeah. I don't expect fair, you to. Fair enough. Yep. Yeah. Because you won't leave Centennial. <laughs> it's but just a waste of time. Like you just waste I – mean, I mean if you can find something productive to do while you're driving. But is it a waste of time? Because I would argue that that, that 30 minutes of riding is a waste anyway. So why not have just – that sort of fluff along there, why not extend the ride a little bit and, yeah, I don't know. I, I wish I could bring myself to do it. It would be not – wouldn't it be great if I could force myself to do it? 40 minute drive yeah, and do a gravel loop, you know, yeah. out northwest. And geez, that'd be a new me. I just can't bring myself to do it. <laughs> so I my, think, my loss. I yeah. think it's a habit thing, though. Like, yeah. just you just get so used to, like, I'm, going, I'm going for a ride, getting in the car. I just don't like riding my bike that much. I'm riding my bike to tick something off. Mm. I don't. But how, yeah. how pissed off did you get on the weekend as we're riding up north <laughs> yeah, was, and we're just stopping every. <laughs> 12 seconds at a traffic light. <laughs> yeah. It's just like, no. Yeah. It's, it's just not fun. It is. Yeah. It did, it did, did uh, ruin that ride for me. But that's, I just, that's why I don't go to Bob and Head very often because I can't be yeah. bothered riding through the city in North Sydney and stopping. I, there's probably 45 sets of traffic lights between here and barely even out of North Sydney. All right. Let us know down below, guys, um, your list of things. Jersey update. It's behind you. Um, they nearly sold out again. So there's three extra smalls and two smalls left. So if you are fitting those sizes, you can grab one now. There is a restock coming uh, in probably a month when it comes in. And I've done a bigger order because I do. I know it's annoying to promote it and people like it and they want to get it and then they go on the size that is out of stock all the time. It sucks. So I've done a, a bigger order and that'll be coming. There's also another design to the skin suit coming which I will just leave. Um, but the regular Nero suit will be coming back in stock too. So that'll be coming. Um, but, yeah, there's, there's three extra smalls and two smalls left. I was thinking about this today because I was riding, yeah. riding in the jersey. <clears throat> Can we discuss the potential of white shorts? It, yeah. Can I, we discuss it? I, I don't also, know. I've, yeah. I've ridden white jerseys in my time and I've, it's never – Never really been something I've seriously considered. I'm seriously considering. Yeah, I am too. Uh, not for the jer not white bib shorts, but doing the Nero suit with white bottoms. Oh. I think would strong. It it would. Mm. Yeah, okay. it might be. We might just do it on the minimum order because mm. <laughs> I don't know how many people mm. want to. But oh, it, it would it would look. Um, but, yeah, it would. It'd be, you did be yeah, something. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. All right. uh, which uh, got me sort of thinking like, so I know a bit about Lycra, but white like, white panted, white, I don't know, like have people had experience with this? Are there brands to look at? I mean, I don't think any of the main brands do them. I know like Rafa doesn't, Map don't. Uh, I, th I think ASOS does. Yeah, if that means running some sort of weird like suspender belt situation, I'm not that keen on it. But yeah, I don't know. I, I, it's 
Crossed my mind here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Speaking of bit of kit, have you had any experience with the Wiggle stuff, the DHB? So I was kind of thinking like just in terms of like value brands and stuff like that. Have you have you heard, have you got athletes riding it? Not that I haven't ridden the kit. I've bought a lot of over the last probably 10 years, a lot of this, the DHB stuff on Wiggle. The thing that stood out for me with, with them was their backpack. So I bought this DHB slice backpack probably six years ago mm. and it still works fine. It's just if finally it's so faded I look like I'm homeless because it's, it's not black anymore. So I went on and I just bought uh, – this was a couple of weeks ago – just bought the, a new version of it. It's the same thing. I think it's like 50 bucks. But on what planet – the, just the value of their stuff. I was just like, how is this still exist? The zippers didn't break. It discolored, which is expected after that long. It was just a fantastic value product. And I just bought another one. I just some of their stuff is um so, they're, they're, so they've got ger- they've got bib shorts, DHB classic bib shorts. Redu- okay, reduced from a hundred bucks. Navy. Oh, they've got navy ones, yeah. 83. $83. I mean I don't know. It's got an elastic interface this. chamois. Yeah, that's the standard. That's what everyone runs. It's just. But that's like there are shit of there. I can tell you there are shitter yeah. versions of chamois than that one. Yeah. Uh, that's pretty. It's pretty <laughs> I don't know good, how isn't you it? make bib shorts for 50 <laughs> 83 dollars. Yeah. Obviously, they're a massive brand, so they have that buying power. They can just, I don't know, just do insane prices. But that's kind of um. Kind of again, use sometimes when the brands get bigger, they they just get more expensive. Yeah. So I I wish there were more brands doing what what Wiggle do, which is get bigger and actually get cheaper, not bigger and more expensive. Yeah. Do they do a skin suit? The reason so I'm on a massive skin suit buzz at the moment. Um, not for not for the uh, Alex Dowsett Aero gains, but just because it's so easy to just put a skin suit on. Like it takes away all the, oh, I've got that jersey. Oh, this one's going to go. Oh, I've got to match. I don't know. They, you just throw it on. Happy days. It feels, I don't know, they just feel comfortable, especially the ones with the little pouch up the front. Yeah. Um, big fan of it. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm on a massive buzz. And I did notice like pretty much all the guys in the US, they all just ride skin suits. That Yeah. I think it's. it could be a big a big change. Okay, a couple of reasons. It's just more comfortable. Like I'm more comfortable in the Nero suit than the Nero jersey and bib shorts. It's just, it just is. Secondly, it is cheaper to – I don't know if it's cheaper to buy because I haven't looked at all the brands, but it's cheaper to produce one skin suit than a pair of bib shorts and a jersey. So in theory, I don't know what the brands do, but the price of a skin suit from a company – from a, a brand should be cheaper than buying the equivalent level jersey and bib shorts. So for a, for a one ensemble, it's it's actually cheaper and more comfortable. Once we can get over the look of it, because it does look kind of like you know when people wear aero socks and and you're a bit oh that's a bit try hard. But I think we're getting over. People are getting over. It. Not all skin suits are created equal in that look. I think so. The reason I ask say that is like because I know. Those guys were running that Allele brand, which is like a California. And I was, I'm on their website now. And I'm looking, and they don't seem to sell the suit that I'm, ta- suit that I'm talking about. But it's really, it's really um, easy on the eye in the sense that it's not like in your face. I'm an aero suit. Like I'm wearing a Rule Twenty Eight. I got my friggin' base layer on. I'm ready to roll here, lads. Like it's, it just looks like, oh, that's a a lighter piece of kit for a hot day. And that was their big thing. It's like, it's a, it is, it, they tend to be pretty breathable things, just the whole, the whole feeling of it. So yeah. Um, and I have noticed that a lot of those, like the DHBs and stuff like that don't seem to offer one yet, like the road suit type thing. So I don't know, maybe yeah, that's coming, but yeah, I don't watch this space again, I reckon, because it makes sense if, yeah. You're getting kit cheaper and it's more comfortable. Yeah. Um, and just I think that, yeah, most brands just don't really do do one. Uh, We're not going to talk about the Paz Normal. Sorry. 
Oh, we got uh, that wrong, by the way. Yeah. It's not, you yeah. don't not pronounce the A, you don't pronounce the S. Correct. Yeah. We, yeah. Yes. So it's not ass normal. It's not ass normal. Panimal. Panimal. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Correction. 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 See, we do correct ourselves. We I'm don't sure. always double down. Please, uh, apologies to um, Panimal um, for getting your name wrong. Um, so, yeah, really, I feel really bad about that. Um, yes. I'm just imagining my wardrobe, cycling wardrobe, if I only had skin suits. It'd be pretty, it'd be pretty cool. So like, there's no decision making. Mm. It just, whoop. Mm. Yeah, skin suit. Like that sort of, yeah, the, the accountant sort of opens the closet and it's just like blue suits or something like that. It's just, yeah, it's just go straight in for it. No, I'm, I, I'm, I'm totally, I'm going to get around it. Yeah. And it's better for the brands too because they don't have to hold double the stock of everything. It's just just extra small to extra large in one product. Mm -hmm. just, they could probably pass those savings on. Yeah. yeah. Did you listen to the, the Jay Vine interview with the road, road man, the Irish guy? Um, not all of it. Okay. He did, yeah, so he did an interview um, with Jay and one of the topics – it was a classic Jay Vine interview. <laughs> I'm already was, worried. No, it was no, no. It wasn't anything bad. It was it was it was quite a good interview actually. Um, <laughs> especially some of the coaching stuff was funny. Jay was like, "Oh, my old coach was using a critical power thing, and it said my FTP was like 470 watts. So I was right. I was cooked all the time because I was I was riding around way too hard." <laughs> there we go. Uh, that was that was funny. Um, but one of the topics he asked Jay was about AI, AI and coaching. Does he think coaching is going to be overridden by AI? Um, which I thought was an interesting topic. I wanted to steal his topic and we can chat about it. Um, <clears throat> by the way, that Roadman podcast, he's, uh, it's definitely kicking off because he keeps getting recommended to my homepage. Um, so probably one of the, in terms of the long form stuff in cycling, is definitely one of the, the bigger up and coming channels. Um, geez, people give us shit for our show like i've never accused someone of riding with a motor because their cadence is high so that that le Monde thing was absolutely oh, talk yeah. about hot takes <laughs> like <laughs> that's another yeah, level okay. isn't it yeah yeah uh, so anyway I'll, I'll i'll leave that um but yeah, yeah so will can, will ai make me redundant will mm. it make coaches redundant uh well it'll make a lot of people redundant before it makes you redundant yeah. put it that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So what's the what's the theory that that I will be uh, all all my data therefore I'll be able to put in the the um, race that I want to do my targets it will soak up all my data it will spit out the uh, workouts that I need to do and sort it. I that's the that I mean that's the idea. I think people undersell it too much, right? So they're like, oh, it can help you improve your training a, a bit and. Things like that. I, if it eventually when it kicks in, I was thinking about it like, in terms of carrying over from what can happen in the, the medical industry mm -hmm. and bringing that over to coaching, right? So here's, here's it, because if it, when it eventually comes, it's not like could it make a coach redundant? Like it 100% will be, it will demolish any coach. You could get a thousand coaches to concur on a training program. The AI will do it better because what, I was listening on another thing talking about AI in the medical field about how it could be used to test drugs. Mm -hmm. So you basically in the AI, uh, in the in the computer, come up with a, a model for a human or, or a certain tissue and then um, feed your – make up your drug, whatever it is, feed it into that, and then you can model what happens. But not just predict what happens. You can literally – you've got like an artificial human in the computer – and then apply the drug to it and see what the outcome is and run and you could, you know, almost an infinite number of different drugs and test all the outcomes, right? So imagine that in the coaching scenario, we have Chris Miller. Instead of saying, I think based on this theory, this is going to be the right training for you, mm -hmm. right? In this super computer, it's going to be super expensive, so I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't imagine it's coming anytime soon, but you, you make the AI Chris Miller. So it's your genetic sequencing put in, it's all your lifestyle that it will know everything that it could have tracked and know everything about. It is literally you in a computer somewhere. And then you say, okay, over three months, I want you, I'm going to get 
the artificial intelligence Chris Miller, I'm going to feed it this three months of training. What's the outcome? And it can not predict what the outcome is. It can tell you what the outcome is because it can run it through and then say, okay, make one slight, let, let's, let's do 3% more ramping in training load. Well, what's the outcome? And you can almost, you could just run through almost an infinite number of simulations and literally arrive at the point where you have the perfect training and not based on a theory, based on literally it run through in an outcome. And I mean, a coach is, a coach is not even going to get close to it, as good a training as what that sort of system. I wouldn't say this is a pushback on it, but isn't the whole, isn't this whole system based on the premise that the metadata, the information that you're putting in is accurate? And this is, this is always my sort of issue with this stuff at the moment is that it's, it's that data that, okay, at a, at a very, very high level elite laboratory testing level, yes, we can probably get that, but at a customer level, you know, just look at an Apple Watch's calorie burn rate and accuracy. Like it's, that data is not accurate. But it doesn't matter because with good AI, it would know if the, it, it will be able to, it would, it would be able to know what bits of, so you're tracking your thing through your Apple Watch and there might be, it, it might be sampling all your vital signs once every five minutes. Right? I don't know what it does, right? Mm. But with good AI, and so right now, if you feed that into whatever software you use, it's then kind of up to the coach to go, oh, I think that was a bit off. Mm. That data's not that good. And so, yeah, the whole process is pretty much trash. But with AI eventually, it doesn't matter if you're putting in half trash data because it would be a, it will be able to distinguish what's good, what's not, pull out the bits that are relevant, discard the bits that are not. And you, you've solved, that problem is solved with an intelligent system that's learnt on you know, whatever bazillion different combinations of data there are. So that's, yeah, I, I, oh, yeah, when the AI gets discussed as it relates to coaching, it's always quite simple. It's like, well, it can help me. It could help you better understand your heart rate variability. But it's like it, it's, mo it's about modelling, not just about mm. sort of analysing your Apple Watch data. It's, yeah, I think it's going to – because it will. I mean, that's obviously doing that sort of modelling – is super expensive and like why the hell would you waste your time doing it for <laughs> cycling training? But it'll get there eventually. Mm -hmm. And then so as a coach, uh, there, there's probably still a job for a coach, you would imagine, but I'm not going to be sitting down there going, oh, I think Chris should do a threshold workout on this day. Why would I – I'm not going to be smarter than a fully <laughs> modelled out, mapped out. I cannot outperform that when it comes in. So I would just – I would be relying on whatever that spits out. And then I would be adding the personal touches that that I can add in that a machine can't. But yeah, I, when it comes, probably not in my. I can't imagine it would be in in my lifetime. What was Jay's take on it? Out of interest, you remember? Was it, I just I, I just I, found I that interesting. No, so I can't hundred percent remember. I think his take was. I think he went a bit off course and basically gave your take, which is, well, sometimes the data that you give isn't that. Isn't that accurate? Because he rides a Shimano power man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think he, from memory, he had that sort of take. But you kind of like, when it comes, it's going to be 10,000 steps ahead of like what, you know, whatever basic yeah. use we could even think of. Uh, it, yeah. I'll have to, I'll have to listen a bit more to that podcast because just, just that alone, I find is an interesting question to ask Jay. Mm. Yeah. Well, it's, 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 Jay's going to give a an answer to that. Yeah. yeah. So, oh, cool. I'll, yeah. I'll check that out. Yeah. I just there's been a few other discussions around it, and people sort of think so, it's like when it comes, it there's no yeah. How is a coach going to outperform a proper mm. quantum computing AI model? Of you, the training will be perfect for whatever scenario you could give. I, yeah, we'll be out of a job for in that. In training prescription, will will certainly be outclassed. Yes. Yeah. Well, it already outperforms doctor. Like uh, mm. um, diagnosing an illness is. Uh, I'm probably speaking out of terms, but like uh, the AI that can uh, uh, diagnose illness based on a variety of symptoms already outperforms most doctors if you give them the symptoms. Now that's obviously extremely basic, but anyway, maybe we leave. Speaking of training. Um 
We were chatting about this the other day. Uh, we've got a sportif coming up back end of – Sportif? Running a sportif? What do you call them? Is that what we're <laughs> – what do you call them? Oh, just road a, races? No, mate, everything's a chop off. It's, it's a just chop. a, cho- it's a right. barrel chop off. The barrel chop off. The barrel classic. So it's a yeah, it's a four or five hour event in October or something. I, I assume you might have some people training for it who mm-hmm. you coach. I just just pay a I just do it. Um, have you are you spotting things at this sort of point? Like, okay, Mis- is mistakes the right word to to yeah. bring this up? Like. General patterns of behavior that's. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The. Okay. So the biggest thing, Barrel Classic is going to take about um, between four and a half and five and a half hours. So the logical way that someone would approach that would be all right, we're, we're two months out from, or people have been training for previous. So Barrel Classic's three months away. Shit. All right. I better start going and doing my five-hour rides and I better start going and climbing some hills because Barrel Classic is hilly. And I, I, I just uh, I think that's the most common mistake I would say for someone training for a long event is just uh, way too – from too far out from the event doing um, too many high training load rides. Like I'll see some people's data and it will be um, four rides a week and then, sorry, not even four hours. I'll look at the higher level data first. I'll be like, oh, training, you know, they're pretty consistent. Five, 600 TSS a week. The hours are pretty good. And then you zoom in one step further and you go and look at their calendar. And it's more often than not, Saturday, five hours, 350 TSS. Mm. And and I, I get it because that's probably the logical way you would approach training. But f- like from, a, from a coach's point of view, that's such a suboptimal way to improve your fitness is by just dosing this dump of training load on one weekend day and then you're pretty cooked for the next probably three days. And my approach most of the time, now there's a place for those rides closer to the event, but my approach pretty much from any more than a month out is I'm, a, and personally in my training, I'm avoiding those pretty much four plus hour days or 200 plus TSS days like the plague. I don't want them. I don't want to go anywhere near them. I'm looking for... Highest training load across the month or across the two months. And I'm going to achieve that by spreading that evenly across the week and not having those 250 TSS days. It'd be like in cycling, it seems to escape people. But if you play it in a gym sense, imagine going to the gym and you do, okay, what do you do? You do your four exercises, you do four sets of each exercise, pretty good session, you go home, right? You're not going to go to the gym and just because you can do eight sets each exercise. I mean, mm. you could if you wanted. And then, well, why not do 12 sets per exercise? Or why don't I just do my entire week of training in one session in the gym? Do 20 sets. So obviously you're not going to do that because you can realize, well, my, my body can't adapt to this amount of strength training in one session. So I'm going to go and do four sets per exercise and I'll come back in two days and do it again. It's like the most basic principle but for some reason in cycling mm. people get scared because they're not doing the five hour ride and they they kill their progress because your body doesn't adapt that well to 300 tss and then 250 tss rides i mean that's 400 tss but it's not good as good as four 100 tss rides in a week it's like it's such a hard mindset to get out of i was thinking back to myself getting into like the sport and starting to sign up to some of these things. And that's what you did on Saturday. You went out with your mates, you did four or four hours. You probably smashed up every hill. You got to probably completely underfilled the whole thing, crawled home and spent the rest of the weekend just recovering, potentially got out on the bike again, maybe on Tuesday and then the following Thursday. And then you went and did it all again on Saturday. But the, the weird thing is, I don't know, it's all mental. Like it's every week you almost needed this reassurance of, yep, I, I've, I can do it. I can do the four or five hours next week. Yep, I can still do it. <laughs> yep, I can still do it. And then and then it gets really the, – the worst part of that is if you miss that weekend ride, like it rains or something like that, then you go into full panic mode and the following Saturday is a freaking six-hour day. <laughs> 
Because you're just sticking the dagger in even further. And it's it's a I don't know, I was just trying to think back. It's like it's almost like it, the the fitness part of it's not even relevant to you. It's just pure confidence, like your own confidence in your ability mentally. Do you reckon? So I was thinking, why do people do this? Okay, there's probably people that think that's better. F- they're just a bit misguided. They probably think that's a better way to get fit. So those people, fair enough. But I think as well, people like it's not. It's kind of annoying to have to ride every day or every second day. Mm-hmm. So people like going and flogging themselves to death on a Sunday. Brilliant. I don't need to ride till next Thursday. Like it's it, it, it's it's kind of a cheat. You're kind of trying to cheat the week. Um, and also the big the big calorie burn, I reckon, as well plays into it. Like, geez, I've burnt five thousand calories this ride. I can absolutely slop, slop my yes. way through the re- this yeah. Sunday night. Yeah. I'm burger and chips. <laughs> We're heading to Gelato Messina, and I, I got it. You got to think that plays a part in it. Whereas going and doing two hours, yeah. and then an hour after, it's not as sexy. So like, I don't want to do that. I reckon that's more often than not the. That's why. It's so hard for me to comment on this now because I'm so removed from that person that I am I'm in that. We, we had this chat when I was away, didn't I? I was like th- the three-hour window for me. If it goes over three hours, I don't want to be there anymore. It's not – I'm not interested in this. Mm-hmm. I'm actively sooky Chris now. And it's – a lot of it is because of that. I just know I'm not – is that. But I know the repercussions of this – later in the day, tomorrow, they're not good. They're not how I want to, like, ride. You're definitely in the minority, though. Yeah. Because most of the people's training data I see they, before I coach them is that is literally that. It, it, it's just what people do. But Tyler's that. Tyler will go to eight hours. Loves it. Oh, but he's a bit unhinged, he's isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> we love you. We love you, mate. But, yes, he's uh, – like that day that we went on the six hour day, he's like, oh, let's go do some extras down into Yosemite Valley. I'm like, what? Are you mad? Um, yeah, but I suppose that's probably the other end of the extreme. But, yeah, I don't know. I just I don't know why I don't enjoy that stuff. Maybe that's why I don't really want to do gravel either because it's not like we can go do a two-hour gravel day. No. A gravel day is like a, a day, day. A literal day. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Um, Let's keep it going. For those still listening, 50-minute club, welcome. Welcome, everyone. Nice to have you here. Because uh, we've had like no well to chat this episode. I haven't really been watch. I've been keeping tabs on the results. Haven't really been watching, to be honest, the amount of crashes. I'm so – I don't want to watch it anymore. Um, that's interesting. So, so many that's crashes. Why, yeah, okay. I, I, I – not just – I no, genuinely am sick of seeing crashes. So from Every the perspective of like stage. you don't want to see like guys getting injured or you just you, it's like it just ruins the results. And- ruins the result. I don't like seeing the guys get injured. Every So I wake up and all I do is watch the GCN highlights and I don't really look forward to watching them anymore because I'm just waiting for mass pile up and in the lead out. And it's more often than oh, – or Jay crashes. Um or just so many crashes. It's, yeah, it's honestly, I don't know what this, if there's a solution or if this is just what the sport is now, but I can't, it's really put me off. Uh, it's, yeah, yeah, that's probably why I don't like watching. I don't disagree. I, I've found that as well. I've found the crashing just, but more from the results perspective, it's just yeah. like, uh, here we go again, another bashed up race that's, yeah, just kind of lost it. Um, look, I'm done with the Vuelta. Yeah. I don't, look, I don't have some hot take on this. It probably isn't a hot take. It's probably pretty common. I just think it's a shit Grand Tour. So it looks like it's an, a basket case in terms of the organization of it, like a race in midnight in Barcelona and pitch black in the pissing rain. Like what are we doing? Which is just ridiculous. Um, then you had sort of – then they kind of push back the other way too far where they cancel stage or they shorten stages where there's like 20 metres of mud 
but a couple of days ago we're we're racing at 60 k's an hour through street sits like aquaplaning across the water so i don't know just it's a basket case from the organizational perspective it does it does not capture the it's got no okay there's angrelu and a few of those sort of clients but there's nothing mythical about it there's none of those like dolomites or Alp, it just doesn't have any of that the red jersey meh you know whatever it just there's there's nothing so here's here's where i'm taking this all right here's where i'm taking this we just we just sell it to the highest bidder all right the third grand tour who's who's got the cash let's send you all there i mean we know that'll probably go to the uae or somewhere i don't care let's 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 but let's get fill the budgets of these teams at the back end of the year let's Go for it. I don't care where it is. Maybe it's in sort of South America. Mm. We're in China, China or something. Or something. Yep. Yep. Let's just sell it to the highest bidder. Ballarat. Jeez, there you go. Ballarat's got all this money. They get national championships every year. Third grand tour in Ballarat. I don't yep. care. Like Send it around? Get it into America. Yeah. Let's let's have it around friggin' Baltimore, Maryland. There's a couple of races happening over there at the moment. At least then it might, I don't know, engage some people. But no, done. Well done, mm. you're done to me. And can I also add the intro sequence to the GCN extended highlights? Have you seen this? No? Okay. If you know, you know. What there's, is it? There's an intro. There's like a song. There's like, remember the To It and Under song? Oh, yeah. It's the Welter feel song. Feel the rush. Nah. See, they should have got I the Feel the, the rush, rush crowd <laughs> down for it. But whoever <laughs> did that, no, nah, that's ridic- ridiculous. No, nah, I'm done. Welter over. And um, only thing that interested me was a few couple of funny things that popped up on Twitter and the rest of it. So I was interested to know were, so what had happened to this FSA 12 speed? I, I have seen it. I have ridden it 18 months ago and it disappeared into the abyss. Turns out Burgos are riding it. So at least three of their riders, I'm p- pixel peeping some of their Instagram profiles, three of their riders are actually on it. One of them's got some Bizarro um, handlebar setup or um, hoods setup, and um, so they are actually running it. And all the only other thing I had was I just liked the little to and fro between Remco and Ganna, where Ganna just called Remco out for wearing the wrong color helmet, and Remco changed it due to Ganna's abuse. Which I wrong colored nice helmet. Oh, I agree. He was wearing a white helmet, not mm. a black one. Oh yeah. Well, um. The other thing that's putting me off the voltage is they don't show the start of the stage. Just kind of where, from from a racing point of view, you, they, that's where you get hooked because you watch the start of the stage and then it brings you back. Whereas now you turn it on and and then you just miss the start and then you just sort of, oh, I'm blocked into the action. Oh, oh whatever. Uh, I That's the reason why the two was so good to watch because you see the start of the stage and you come back in the morning and watch the rest. So that's totally th- throwing me off too. Yes. Yeah. I don't know what. Yeah. Mm. No. Done. Mm. Third grand tour. And it's also so late. It's September. We're all cooked from watching bike racing. Yeah. I don't know how the boys are doing their podcast on it. Yeah. Uh, oh God. <laughs> Who cares anymore? Bring no. on next season. No. I'm done. Get it in yeah. Africa. Get it somewhere interesting. No. I'm. I've, I'm Is it later it. than usual? I thought it was always August. It might be a week later, but uh, that was because of. Um, the world's okay. moving forward. Right, yeah. yeah it's not, it's it not a, a dramatic shift. It was a bit late, yeah. Favourite Vuelta moment of the last decade? Case so it's such an irrelevant <laughs> case. Right. Right. There you go. Well, uh, uh, what did, I don't know, what do you got? Got Jay's two stages. Jay, yeah. Crashing, got, got, Jay driving the driving bottle the car. and going under yeah. the car. Well, Contador's win a few years ago, that was good. He did something. can't remember what it was. When he beat, oh, God, the people who watch Pro Cycling are going to call me out for this one. Um, Rodriguez, uh, who was leading, and Contador did a classic Contador 80K mm-hmm. breakaway. Not breakaway, but like mountainous stage. Took all the time back and won it. Yeah. Actually, no, I do have one. Uh, Hugh Carthy winning the – he won the oh, Angler yeah, stage. Angler and stage. just because the – his body is like, oh, <laughs> you look so horrible. But he must be doing about 500 watts. So it's just that his bo- he's so tall. It's like you, you, you should not be doing this. 
but it, he's just so lean and yeah, that's so just from a physical output point of view, that's probably stays in my mind. Yeah. That moment right there, that's that's this week's reel, and it's going to be that bit of you saying, oh, Hugh Carthy looks so crap on a bike, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. And I don't know what it is about the real audience, mm-hmm. but they really, <laughs> like that Pidcock oh, yeah. thing, have you read some of the comments under that? Oh, oh yeah. man. They, not happy? They are Disagree. not. And the, my favourite oh. one is when people say, oh, you guys are just jealous. <laughs> <laughs> like, What? What are you uh, talking about? Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> I just I, I do think there's a there's a real difference between the, the Instagram crowd. They're obviously like full fan fan fans, whereas mm. I think the YouTube crowd maybe have a little bit more context. Well, they've like, watched the actual video, yeah. which helps. Doesn't help jealous, that the reels. What we're jealous of. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I was jeez, I'm jealous because I was close a couple of years <laughs> yeah, back. I know. But I just so couldn't. Close. I never quite got yeah. there. My 300 watt threshold just didn't quite <laughs> get me there. And <laughs> oh, politics, politics. <laughs> but, but but hold on, with the, with the Ineos stuff, mm. there's a bit. People are on. Uh, where, all their riders have seemingly gone. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I've. Oh, I, yeah, I think you should triple down. St- no, there's something going on with that team. Yep. I, I, there really is. Yep. I, I think I'm on. I think I'm a. I'm on to something well, here. I mean, yeah, we had bloody Yumbo Visma riders testing positive, and now Ineos guys bailing. I think we're. Could yeah, be ahead of the curve. Something, mm, something in the waters, I think, with Ineos. Well, isn't Brailsford back and then reversed all the decisions that were made when he was not there? And so now they're in this plate where all the transfers that they were going to make, this is all secondhand information from that Lantern podcast that I listened to a few weeks ago. Right. Okay. Yeah. You kind of, you're probably one step more detail. I, I, my claim is there's something going on. Oh. You've actually got some details with Bra- I don't know what with Brailsford. You're on a vibe. I'm on a I'm on okay. a vibe. This is like more of a vibe level, okay. and you're coming in with way too many facts. I I, I, <laughs> I bow to your vibe. <laughs> okay, I'm back in the vibe in. Right. Good, thank you. All right, guys, it's good to be back. Good to be back in the studio. JC, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having me, and we will see you all next week. 